Hey, what's up, Nerdgasm fans? Jerry here, a.k.a. Barnacles. Now, this is the fifth installment in the Codegasm series. You guys have been waiting a while for this one, so I hope you like it. In this episode, we're finally moving out of that console where you just had input and output, and we're moving into the GUI, otherwise known as the graphical user interface. We're going to go ahead and kick this first lesson off by showing you how to create a simple web browser and explaining some of the concepts of object-oriented UI development versus just straight console development. I think you guys will get a kick out of this series. If you haven't seen the first Codegasm 1 through 4, I'd urge you to watch them if you're not familiar with software development. However, if you are familiar with software development, object-oriented programming, and UI development, you can start out right here. It's your choice. All right, let's get nerdy. All right, guys, we're going to jump right into this and start our UI development by opening Visual Studio. That's usually how we start these things. If you need to know how to install Visual Studio, just watch Codegasm Episode 1. All the details are there. Now, I should probably move my face because I am blocking everything. Come on, XSplit. There we go. All right, now I'm down in the corner where I belong. Okay, just like usual, we're going to start off by creating a new project. You can either click New Project here on the little start page, or you can go up to File and New Project, whichever way you prefer. Now, normally, we create a C-sharp Windows console application, but since we're changing things up and we're going to be creating a user interface, we're going to opt to create a Windows form application. Now, there's another type of UI application you can create called a WPF application, which stands for Windows Presentation Framework. We're not going to cover that in this episode, but that is a different way of creating and managing your UI. We're going to use Windows Forms applications because they're the most common UI application that's created. So that's where we're starting. All right, let's go ahead and give this application a name. We're going to call this Simple Web Browser. You can call it whatever you want, though. It doesn't really matter. Okay, click OK. Our project is now being created. Now, you'll notice a couple things different from when we usually do development. The key differences that you're going to notice here is notice it didn't bring up code. It brought up a UI that shows like a window. There's, there's like a little window in here. This is the forms designer. This is basically as your toolbox and your UI for developing what your program is going to look like. Now, the common elements over here is you have your solution explorer right here with all your code in it. And you have your properties down below. But you have something new over here called a toolbox. Now, in your toolbox, you can pull out any of the common tools. You have buttons, check boxes, list boxes, color dialogues, selectors, file selectors, you, you name it. They're basically, all the common controls that you see that make up your, your most of your applications, they're in that toolbox, ready to use. And if you need something that isn't in the toolbox, you can create it yourself custom. Now, in the previous programs I've shown you, under program.cs has been the source code that we've, we've been working with. Now, if you notice, here's the namespace. We have our namespace, simple web browser. We have our class, which is program. And we have our entry point, main. Now, that's common. That's the same as all the applications we've been working on before. But you'll notice that they created code for us under main already. You see there's three lines of code in there. The first two lines just enable visual styles and set some compatible text rendering default thing that I have no the hell idea what it does. Um, but the last one that's most important here is application.run new form one. It's basically creating a new instance of the form one class or otherwise known as object. Now, if you come over here to the solution explorer, you can see there's a form one designer. If I click on that, that's going to be that UI that I told you about. If you click on this, see you got your UI for editing. But if you drill down here on this guy where you click on form one, this is the code of the object. You can see there's partial class form one. So when it's saying create new form one, it's creating this class. Now, you, we're not going to use it in this lesson, but you see this partial word right here? Whenever it says partial, it means that that class can be defined in multiple files. And then at compile time, it brings all of those classes together into one class. It's not something that's very heavily or commonly used in .NET development, but it is there and available. All right, now normally for console development, we just get in here and start doing everything under main. We would just put all of our code right here. But because this is a Windows application, what's going to happen is when it runs this form, it's going to create that UI for form one. Watch, when I run it pressing Control F5, you see it pops up. It's just an empty window. That's all it is. It's an empty window I can resize called form one. Now, when I push X, this function right here returns and the program exits. So this is otherwise known as a blocking function, application.run. But that's where things start. So application.run sets up your UI and starts your UI application. Now, UI applications work completely different. Let me explain how that works. So we need a couple of controls first so that I can give you a little demo of what's going on. So let's start off with a button. Let's just go grab a button control 
right over here. We're going to drag it out there. You can literally drag it in the UI. You can resize it. You can do whatever you want. We're just going to put a button down here in the corner. Okay. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to get a rich text box. A rich text box is just like a regular text box, except for it can have rich text in it, meaning colors and fonts and multiple lines and all that goodness. All right. So now I've created a button and I've created a text box. Now, what happens? What if I want to do something when I click the button? Well, we're going to double click this button here, just like this, and it's going to take us to the code and create a function. It created a function called button one underscore click. Now, Visual Studio is doing a lot of the work for me. Normally, what I would have to do there is I'd have to create, if I wanted to do it purely in code, I'd have to create the text box controller, fill out the properties, add it to the form one's control collection, and a whole bunch of other crap. But Visual Studio helps me do that very rapidly. When the button is clicked, this will be executed. It's that simple. So if I click this button here, button one, the code here is going to run. So now we have a rich text box up here that we created, and it's actually called rich text box one. I'm going to bring the properties window up here so you guys can see it a little better. If we come down here, you can see it's called rich text box one. That's the name of the control, and that's how we access it programmatically. So if we go back to the button one code, so I'm going to double click button one, I'm going to say rich text box one. That's the instance of that box. Append text, that's the name of the function for appending text. And I'm going to say a button was clicked. And I'm going to add backslash R and backslash N to the end, which means add a return line feed and new line. So it'll just make sure it'll go down to the new line at the end of each print. Now, if I run this code, watch what happens. So now I have my UI. Now, when I push this button, watch what happens. A button was clicked. You see that? Pretty simple, pretty elegant. Unlike console development where you're having to call the functions, it's a different type of programming called event-driven programming. So, and this is, this is another big aspect of object-oriented programming. We haven't dealt with events yet. Now, what events are is they're functions that are basically called by the operating system in response to actions. But the events can, you, events can be used for literally anything. But in the context of how we're using it here, when I click this button, if I come over here to the properties and click on the lightning bolt right here, you can see these are all the events that this button can raise. This button can create events when the mouse uh, capture changes on a mouse click on a double click. Uh, it can even do uh, some other stuff down here. Look like if I drag over it, uh, key up and key down, mouse over, mouse hover, mouse leave. So the mouse coming, I mean, you, all these are events that can be called when things occur. So right now you can see we have click bound to button one, but let's say, we want something to happen when we move the mouse over it. So if we come down here to mouse, mouse enter or mouse hover. So there's mouse enter and mouse leave, which means the mouse enters the perimeter of the button and the mouse leaves the perimeter of the button. So I'm gonna go ahead and double click that. Now we've created a new event. So this code will run anytime the mouse is inside of the control. Okay, or I should say the button, just, just to be clear. Okay, so now if I say in here, rich text box one, append text, the mouse has entered the button. Okay, we're gonna run it, control F5. Now notice when I put the mouse over the button, it says the mouse has entered the button, the mouse has entered the button. Each time I go over it, it says the mouse has entered the button. Now, unlike console programming where it's very linear, run a function, run a function, run a function, run a function, what's happening here is we're basically sitting idle waiting for instructions to come in, basically for these events to be fired. And then when the events fire, we do work and fire other events. And that's how this whole UI thing works because you have multiple vectors. If you click a button, it might have another control populate. And then as that control populates, it's populating a third and then a fourth and then a fifth. And because there's so many things going on in parallel and so many interactions, it makes more sense to do this event driven model where a leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to D and so on. Let's go ahead and add a backslash R backslash N just to clean that up. So now let's say when the mouse exits. So we're gonna go back to the form. We're gonna go back to our events and we're gonna say, okay, we want a new one under mouse. We're gonna do on mouse leave because we already did mouse enter. So let's do mouse leave. And on mouse leave, we're just gonna copy that same block of code down here. When the mouse leaves, enter text into the text box. I'm just putting my little random comments in here. So the mouse has left the button. So now if I run this, we have the mouse is entered, mouse is left, mouse is entered, mouse is left. Click, 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 the button was clicked. You can see the events happening in real time. This is UI development. This is how it works. 
Now behind the scenes there's something called a Windows message queue and it's basically this like really really fancy thing where every single time something happens in the OS whether you click a button or click a key on the keyboard a message becomes generated and then your program goes through and consumes those messages and acts on them. Well you don't have to worry about any of that because the .NET framework abstracts that entire layer and just makes it all events just like we're doing right now and it's very very simplistic and elegant. We, I've shown you how to add controls and how to have the controls interact with each other. Now, there's a couple UI problems you're going to run into. Like, for instance, if I resize this, notice the window resizes, but the controls do not. To fix that, there's something called anchors. So let's click on this, come over to our little properties. So we're going to click on the little properties tab again. If we come down here to the bottom, you'll see that there's anchors. Now, what the anchors do is tell it where to tie the edges of the control relative to its surrounding window. And you can have controls inside of controls inside of controls nested as deep as you want to go. But we're just going to keep it at one level deep for this. All of our controls are just going to be under the main window form. So now that I've done that and I've anchored it, I'm going to anchor it actually to all four sides so that it grows with the window. And then for the button, I'm going to just anchor it to the lower right like that. So now the button is anchored to the lower right. Now watch what happens when I run this. Okay, now when I resize the window, look what happens. See how the controls stay at the right sizes regardless of the size of the main window? That's how you want it. That's how most programs are. You want to make sure that it works at any resolution in whatever size window the person puts it out, whether they dock it to the left or dock it to the right. That'll solve that problem. And you can see all of our events are firing. Everything's working just like it should. All right, so now you have a basic understanding for how this UI development works versus the console development. So what we're going to do now is we're going to create a very simple web browser because the Internet Explorer rendering engine is actually a part of the .NET framework and is an accessible, well, I shouldn't say a part. It's accessible through the .NET framework. So it's very, very simple for us to create a web browser object and manipulate it. All right, so let's come back over here. We're going to delete this button and that. We're going to get back to a clean form. I'm going to delete all these functions because we don't need any of them. Those were all just to give you guys a little example of what's going on here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to create our little web browser. And for our little web browser, we need a couple of things. First, we need a menu bar because it's actually a menu strip. You'll see this is familiar. Most programs have it, like file, and then you might have a command called exit. You literally just type them in. So you have file exit, and then we'll just have an about box. So we got our file exit, and we got our about box. So first of all, let's go take care of exit. So you're going to click, double click on exit. Now this function says, okay, so this, again, this is the function that happens. Uh, this function is called when the exit menu item is selected. Now, all we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, which, which means the form that we're in. Whenever you, whenever you use the word this in programming, it means the instance of the object that you're inside of. So we're gonna say this dot close, just like that, that simple. So now if I run my program, you see I have a little menu bar at the top. I'm gonna go to file, exit, boom, program's closed. Now, if I didn't have that code in there, of course, it wouldn't do anything. So I just commented the code out. Now, exit does nothing. Now, for the about box, we're just going to use a simple message box. This program was made by Jerry, otherwise known as AKA Barnacules. All right, just like so. Now, if I run this and I go to about, I get a message box. This program was made by Jerry, AKA Barnacles. And you can see dialogues, because they're modal, meaning they block, you can't access the form behind it until you press OK and dismiss it. All right, well, obviously, we can't have our program called Form 1, so let's name it to something else. We're going to come over and change the text to dun -dun -dun, Simple Web Browser Version 0 0.00001 Alpha. All right, now you can see up here it's a Simple Web Browser V00. And we can also change the icon for it, too. If you come down here, you can see you can have whatever icon you want. All right, we're just going to leave the default icon, but if you want, you can go create an icon in Photoshop, for instance, and save it and then import it. And you need like a 16 by 16, I think uh, 32 by 32. You have to do a couple different resolutions, but then you can go ahead and put that in place. But it's not important for this. So what we're going to do is because this is a web browser, let's make it look like the typical web browser. We have a text box at the top. And here we're going to drag a text box over here. We'll just go ahead and put that up here in the middle. And then we need a button to start the search, right? So let's go ahead and get a button. Put a button right here. Let's move it over to the side. We'll stretch this out a little bit. And we'll call the button. Oops, don't want to click on that just yet. We want to give the button a name. So you go down to text. We're going to call it navigate, like so. And for our text box here, let's go down and make the default text HTTP colon whack whack. 
That way people know when they look at the control that that's more than likely the style of URL they have to enter. All right, so now we need a web browser object. So for the web browser object, we're going to bring it out here and dump it on the screen. And we're going to go ahead and resize it. Just like so. And now you can see we have a web browser control here. We have a text box up here. We have a navigate. Now let's, uh, let's go ahead and add a status bar too. So a status strip. Now there's a status strip down here at the bottom of the window. So you can say, I want to create a progress bar. Let's go ahead and create um, a status label and we'll leave it at that. So now we have a place where we can put text right here. We have a place where we can indicate status, like how, how long it's taking to load. We have a place to view the web page, a place to navigate and a place to type it in. So we have pretty much the fundamentals that we need for a web browser. All right, so if we run this program right now, we haven't written any of the code behind it yet. But if we run this program right now, you can see, hey, we have a blank control here in the middle, right? We have just the default text down here, nothing in the progress bar. I mean, nothing's happening. You click navigate, nothing happens. All we've got is about that works. All right, so now we gotta start wiring stuff up. So the first thing we need to do is the navigate button. When we click that navigate button, that's when stuff's gonna happen. Not when we're typing in a URL. We don't need to do anything then, just when we hit navigate. So I'm gonna double click navigate. And the very first thing that I'm gonna do in Navigate is I'm gonna look for our web browser object. You can see it's web browser one that's created. Navigate is the function that we wanna call. We wanna pass it the text from this box, which is text box one. And you can see IntelliSense brings it up so we know it's real. And we're gonna just do dot text. So what this is gonna instruct it to do is when I click on button one, it's gonna take the web browser one control and tell it to navigate to the URL that's defined in the text box above. So now I've tied those three controls together. So let's just put a little comment in here. On click of this button, the web control will display the page requested in the text box by URL. Okay. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and I'm going to bring the properties down here and hide them. All right, so now if I run this program, watch what happens. Okay, so we're going to go up here and we're going to type something in. We're going to go to httpbing.com, then I'm going to click Navigate. Hey, lo and behold, that looks pretty promising, except we have a problem. Notice when we resize it, nothing's working. Yep, that's those damn anchors again. We have to go anchor everything. So the way that this is going to work is this, our text box, let me move our properties back up here needs to be anchored, needs to be anchored to the top, the left, and the right. The button just needs to be anchored to the top and the right. Now the anchor is just that, it means it holds that edge of the control relative to its parent container. So if you anchor it on all four sides, it's gonna grow with the window like this. If you anchor it just on the sides, it's gonna grow horizontally, but not vertically, and so on and so forth. Okay, now for our web browser control, we wanna anchor that on all sides. And now that we've done that, if we run the program, we're gonna navigate again to Bing, httpbing.com. Notice when I push enter, nothing happens. Normally in a web browser, enter works. I'll show you how to wire that up in just a minute. Okay, I click navigate. There we go, boom, full screen, I have a web browser. Okay, so now that's working. Now let's go ahead and push put enter on there because I don't wanna always have to click the navigate button, so we want enter to do something. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to the events for the text box. And I'm gonna look through all the events. You can see there's like a bajillion events here. So what I'm gonna look for is the key press event right here. So I'm gonna double click it. And now it created this thing as text box on key press. This function will fire every single time a key is pushed and released. Cause that's what key press means. Okay, now if you notice, this has this key press args event handler or event arguments passed in. If you look at it, it has, uh, a Boolean saying whether the key was handled or not, whether the control did something with it or not, and the character that was pressed. All we care about is the character that was pressed. So if the character pressed equals console key enter, okay, I had to change that up a little bit. What I basically had to do is cast console enter to a character because it's actually looking for a character. So now, if the keystroke was enter, then do something. All right, so now we know if we're inside here and we're running this code, the enter was the key that was pressed. So now if I wanted to, I could just copy this code verbatim and put it right there and say when enter is pressed, navigate. But the problem that we have with that is we may want to do something more than navigate later and that way we would have to change it in two places and that would suck. Yeah, that's, you don't want to have to keep repeating code over and over again. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our own function out here called navigate. 
all it is. Or we'll just say, yeah, yeah, no, no, navigate's fine. Navigate to page. This will be our core navigation function. This is the core function that will perform all navigation and post processing. Okay, so in our navigate to page function, we're gonna copy this code and put it right there. And then we're gonna call navigate to page right here and right here. That way we're calling one function in both places and if I need to change how things navigate, I can make all those changes in this function and they'll happen in both places. Now there's another option that you can do here if you want and that is you can just call the event yourself. You can basically say, I wanna call button one underscore click, pass it no sender, and since we don't use the event args, you can just pass null there too. And that'll work because now what'll happen is if I press enter, it'll simulate the button click. And that way we'll get the same behavior. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do this. So let me go ahead and run this right now. So now if we type httpbing.com and just press enter, oh, there it goes, okay. So now you can see enter actually works. If I go to eBay, it goes to eBay. So that, that works. Okay, so now what I wanna do is until the page is done loading, I don't want you to be able to navigate again. So I'm basically gonna disable this control in this control until navigation's completed. Now the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna click on my navigation control right here, and I'm basically gonna go find an event called document completed. This is what happens when this, this event gets fired when the document's done loading. So now under document completed, I'm gonna say go ahead and take button one, enabled equals true, and text box one, enabled equals true. Now I'm also gonna go up to where we start our navigation here, where we disabled the button and we're also gonna disable the text box. So now when I click enter or I click the button, it's gonna disable the text box and the button until the page finishes loading. So here's our little web page. We're gonna to go to httpbing.com. Now watch, you'll see the text box is disabled. That now that happened really fast. Let me find a page, it takes a little while longer to load like Reddit. Okay, now you can see navigate and this bar are disabled while it's loading. See, they're both still disabled and boom, there you go. Okay, so now we have a way to basically disable those controls while it's thinking. Now, what about a progress bar? We put that progress bar down at the bottom, so let's go ahead and use it. So there's another event, so we come over here and click our little browser control. There's an event called progress change. Now, progress change gets fired periodically to tell you what the project, pro, the progress has changed. You can see this current progress and maximum progress. Maximum progress here says gets the total number of bytes in the document being loaded, and current process is a number of bytes that have been downloaded. So maximum progress is how many bytes are expected. Current progress is what byte it's currently on. With those two numbers, you can extrapolate percentages. All right, so now what we wanna do is we wanna use this little progress bar that we put down here. So let's go look at it. Over here in the properties, it's called tool strip progress bar one. So we're just gonna say tool strip progress bar one dot progress bar dot value. And this is gonna be between one and 100%. All right, so we're gonna take E current progress, multiply it by 100, and then divide it by maximum progress, and that'll give us a rough percentage. And then, of course, we need to convert that to an integer, so we'll just do that right here, so that it can go into value. Now, we do run into another problem here, and that is a divide by zero error. There is a chance that current progress or maximum progress could both be zero, and in the event that they are, that's gonna create an error. So we're gonna say if e current progress is greater than zero, and E maximum progress is greater than zero, then go ahead and update. Otherwise, don't do anything, and then that'll get around the divide by zero error. Now, another thing you're gonna to wanna to be aware of is from here on out when you're developing in the UI, uh, sometimes errors are lost. They'll occur and they'll never present themselves anywhere where you can see them. And in those cases, you're kind of screwed. In the console application, you always got the error. Your program would just crash. Well, because now you're dealing with multiple threads and all that stuff, you're not always guaranteed to get an error message. So I recommend running under the debugger. So press F5 instead of Control F5 or go up to debug and select Start Debugging. That way, if you encounter an error, it'll actually break right in the code and tell you where the error is. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and hit F5 to run this under debug. Now you can see there's a little orange bar across the bottom of the screen indicating we are in the debug mode. So let's go ahead and try it out. Let's go to youtube.com. Okay, well I noticed our navigation bar didn't quite make it to 
There it goes. Now I made it to 100%. And now the progress bar is working. Now, just like with any code, there's gonna be a couple bugs here and there to work out, but hey, that gives you guys something fun to do. All right, so now back in the designer, we have our little uh, status box down here. I just named it current status, and we wanna actually put something in there now. So now if we go to navigate the page, let's go ahead and look for our status box, tool strip status label one, text, we're gonna make it evil beginning, or we'll just say navigation has started. And then just like before, we're gonna copy this. So that's where the navigation starts. And then down here when the document's done loading, we're gonna change it to navigation complete. Now by adding that little piece, we're gonna go ahead and hit F5 and run. Now when we navigate to say twitter.com, you're gonna see down here below, it's gonna change the status for us. Navigation started, navigation complete. If we go to Bing, navigation started complete. Read it. Navigation started, navigation complete. Okay, so at this point, we have a basic web browser. As you can see, it can be resized. It's actually a functional web browser. So if I go to eBay, I can click on stuff. I can use it just like a regular browser. I can even use my scroll mouse. So now that we have full control over the web browser object and we have the ability to tie controls to it, you can see there is a lot of stuff that you can do here. You could create something that would download all the images from the page. We might do that in a future project. You could create something that would actually automatically navigate and go and randomly find links and follow them and it'd be like watching TV, just walk in your web browser, walk across the web. I mean, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. And you have full control over the browser object. Like, let me give you an idea of just how full control you have. So let's say uh, when the document's completed, this is our document completed event, let's go ahead and screw with the contents of the web browser. So the web browser has a document object and the document object contains all the HTML. You can do anything you want with it. So let's go ahead and go find a picture of a cat because cats are awesome. So let's go to Bing, go to images, do a search for funny cat. All right, there we go. I eat it a butter. Okay, we're gonna copy the image URL. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here and we're gonna say inside of the document, there's a list of all the images. So we can actually go through those images and replace them all with this cat. It's pretty easy to do too. For each HTML element image in the image collection, we're just gonna take image dot set attribute. SRC is now gonna be equal to the URL to our cat. That's all I'm gonna do. Just that one little thing. Let's run our thing. We're gonna go to uh, eBay. Look at that. I eat it a butter, I eat it a butter, I eat it a butter, everything's I eat it a butter. You know, let's go to Bing. Down across the bottom, everything's a cat. You guys can see it, right? All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I showed you how to create a simple web browser. I showed you how the UI components work together and how this is different from a console application. And the source code for this project will be available. You can find the link in the video description. And feel free to modify it to your heart's content. You should really try playing around with the web browser objects, but be very, very careful and use F5 when you're running. Run under the debugger so you can see when errors are occurring because it is very easy to create things like infinite loops. Like when I started modifying the web browser in inside of one of the events, I caused a problem because every time I modified the document, it would run the event again, and then the event would modify the document, run the event again, and it would get caught in that infinite loop. You have to be conscious of those. And there's ways to break those too. You can basically say, go through and do the swap, and then when the event's called the second time, have some kind of a switch to prevent it from running that block of code on the second iteration, and so on and so forth. There's lots of ways to deal with these problems, but hopefully this gives you a framework to understand how this differs from console applications, and I hope that I've given you a basic starting application that gives you a lot of room to play around and, and basically unleash your own creativity. If you guys like the video, please hit that like button. It's huge motivation for me to create these videos and it also lets me know that people are enjoying the content. Also leave comments down below. I like to peruse through there every once in a while. And if you want to come ask me a question, I'm at Barnacles over on Twitter. 
I really do enjoy creating these Codegasm episodes. They are an incredible amount of work to shoot and edit, uh, as you might imagine. <laughs> but um, it's totally worth it because you guys have been showing a lot of support and you've been enjoying them. And it's something that I actually have a lot of pleasure doing. And I'll be honest, I ran off on so many tangents during this video. I had to hold myself back a lot because I immediately was like, oh, man, it'd be really cool to write this and do this and do this and do this. But all that stuff would have been several hours of additional lessons. So if you guys like this path we're going down, in the next Codegasm, we can actually keep building on this project. Or if you'd like to see something different, let me know. All right, guys. Thank you again for all of the support that you've given me. Uh, the channel's been growing like crazy. This is my full-time job now, so you guys are actually supporting me and my family. And I really appreciate it. And nothing makes me happier than to bring you guys some form of education, entertainment, some lols, whatever. All right. Thanks for getting nerdy with me, guys. Till next time. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. It helps me a lot. Also, come over to Twitter. I'm at Barnacles. I'm a real social guy. Also, if you have a couple of minutes, check out some of these many other videos. I made them myself. <laughs>